I'm here to talk to you about strategy. Uh, my name is Todd Paglia. I'm with Stand.Earth. And uh, we take on companies and hold them to account. We challenge companies to change and transform what they're doing. And so we look at different sectors in the global economy that are sort of subject to change. We started looking at the fashion sector about seven years ago because they were, you know, in our terms, neglected. They were not really being pressured to change on climate. There were moments of disaster, periodic controversy, but no sustained pressure on climate. It's important because they're about 5% of the climate problem is the fashion sector. It's one of the most polluting in the world. And Boston Consulting says that they're in the top 10 for being able to transform. So kind of perfect for us. They're also very brand sensitive. So we looked at the sector, um, began analyzing the different brands, their impacts, their attributes, their political leanings, and we had to start somewhere. And we have about, just for, for setting the stage here, we have like three people working on this. And like a part-time digital person, part-time comms person, we're gonna try to change a trillion dollar sector. So that's our challenge. Um, we have to start somewhere. We start with Levi's. Uh, we ask them if they're willing to sit down and talk and develop a world-leading climate policy. Um, and uh, not very surprising, they said no. Um, we don't take no for an answer. So our next step was to uh, begin to gently encourage them to do more on climate change. Um, the reason we picked this sector and the reason we picked Levi's is seven years ago, all of the climate commitments by this sector applied to stores and headquarters only, not to where they made their products. So if you take stores and headquarters, what's your guess for the percentage that is for their total climate footprint? 1%, 1 very good, yes, 1%. So they're making climate promises and commitments, getting media, the media is writing about it for 1% of their climate problem. We said they have to take care of 100% of it. We start our campaign, um, they resist it. Uh, we keep analyzing what their, the scope of the problem is. We come up with a really great stat, which is 21 pounds of coal to make a single pair of Levi's. We repeat that about a million times over the course of 18 months. We drive media, social media. We talk to the employees. Um, all the time in their San Francisco headquarters. We know they're on our side, San Francisco, they're gonna be progressive. And we keep pressuring them and we actually write exactly the policy that we think that would be required and would change the way the fashion sector looks at their climate problem. Um, on and on and on, pressuring them, pressuring them. We, uh, you may notice in this slide, there's a Levi and Strauss, Levi Strauss and CO2 like kind of insider, see we put a two at the CO, um, which apparently they really, really hated. And, uh, and so we then did it all the time. Um, had climb, people climb up on their headquarters and put that two back on after they removed it. Um, after 18 months, they went from a totally fake climate commitment to one where they were now gonna go from reducing 20% of GHGs for their stores and headquarters to 90%. And they were also going to take on 40% reduction by 2025 in their entire supply chain. So that's a couple of people applying the right strategy to a giant corporation. And now we need to level the playing field. So we go out to the whole sector, um, telling them that this is the new standard to meet or beat. And if you do something even better, you'll get lots of credit. Your employees will be happy. Your shareholders will be happy. Your customers will be happy. Um, and if you don't, then what happened to Levi's will happen to you, um, meaning you'll be exposed for putting out fake commitments. And uh, they started to respond. We had a race to the top beginning where um, science-based targets, there were almost no fashion brands had a science-based target. Um, after Levi's, we sent out a letter to the whole industry and said, basically, you're next, or you can adopt a policy. And they all started adopting new policies. We're now working with them to implement those policies on the ground. Um, and we started looking for our next challenge. So we're not done with fashion. We have a lot further to go, but they're beginning to change. And we're negotiating right now with one of the biggest brands in the world on a first ever policy to not just set aggressive climate goals, to begin financing the transition. So putting their own money on the line to move their factories to renewables. Um, that should be out in the next month or so, so stay tuned. 
agriculture. Again, this is sort of David versus Goliath picture. Strategy is what we're focusing on to tilt industrial agriculture. Um, we've honed in on these folks. These are the four, the ABCs. Um, these are the four companies that buy, sell, and trade the vast majority of all the food that we all eat. Um, and they do mostly terrible things. Cargill is the biggest by far. They're bigger, almost bigger than all the others combined. And they're kind of a strategy conundrum, right? So they're a private company. They don't have institutional shareholders. It's really hard to get their customers to boycott them. For example, McDonald's buys all of their eggs from Cargill. Like there's nobody else that can provide that. So campaigns have been going after Cargill for literally decades and not making a lot of progress. Uh, but we had a new idea. So we had this. This is the Cargill family. They own the company. They have more billionaires than any other family on the planet. And they're mostly disconnected from the company. So as owners, they get a check every year. It's between $2 million if you're a small owner or $115 million if you're a large owner. And it's not a bad piece of passive income. But uh, it's not great if it starts to haunt you. And one of the things that we found out about this family is that they're very, very private. They don't like publicity. They want to stay out of the spotlight. And so we wrote to them and we said, we think you're good people. We think that your company is misleading you. And we think you would change it if you had the information. So we boxed up every sanction, complaint, lawsuit, um, indictment against the company since 2014 and mailed it to them. And we said, you now have the information. And we op published an open letter in the New York Times saying, dear Cargill family, we know you would do the right thing if you had the right information. We've sent it to you. Your company is not telling you the truth about their impacts. Um, we ended up getting 100 plus articles on the launch of that. We then started advertising in the community newspapers in all of their homes, second homes, third homes, fourth homes, um, saying the same thing. We think you will change this company's behavior if you knew what they're doing, now we have a whole website with everything they've ever done that's been bad. Um, we also created a video just for them. We geo-targeted this so that it went just to their homes and their headquarters um, and their family offices, and they watched it a lot. We got 100,000 views of this video, and we spent $4,000, and they watched it many, many times. So we were getting to them. We then had one of our indigenous allies, Becca Munduruku, come and try to meet with the family and the company. They refused. The left hand image is a new full page New York Times ad. So, the, you know, the heat's going up a little bit. Um, the family starts to get worried that this might spill over and become a real problem. At the end of last year, they announced a commitment to eliminate deforestation and land conversion by 2025. Now, there's much more work to do. We need to make that implementation, implementation really happen. But this is the first time that the family has been motivated to move what the company does. So you would think with like a few people and not a lot of money, if we're able to move whole sectors of the economy, that this would be a very common type of campaign. And it is not. It's pretty rare. And in fact, just to give you a snapshot of global giving, most Giving does not go to climate and environment. Um, about 2 or 3% goes to climate and environment. And when you look at the climate and environmental funding, a huge amount of it goes to groups that are perfectly fine, good groups, the very large uh, nonprofits that mostly collaborate with companies. The funding that goes to organizations that challenge companies to change is, again, kind of mirroring the global picture, about 2 or 3%, really, really small numbers. And we can change this. Um, we have to move the philanthropic conversation to not avoiding risk, not avoiding controversy. We need to take chances. We're in an emergency. We need to act like it. And the amazing thing right now is that so much more is possible with these kind of strategies and these kind of campaigns. And that's lucky for us because so much more is required. And I think with the people just in this room, we can begin to change this conversation 
and take on companies and hold them accountable and meet the climate challenge. Thank you. <laughs>